Hey everyone, uh, this is author Hunter Blaine. I'm here with the Hall of Fame narrator Luke Daniels to talk about just uh, uh, some fun stuff that we got going on. So, uh, Luke, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Excited so, to um, get to actually see you and talk to you and not just read your words. This is like right? live and in the flesh. Uh, <laughs> now I like it. Well, it's it's funny. One of the questions is um, um, someone asks, um, how much direction do I give you? And, you know, how do we have to talk about stuff? And uh, uh, my answer to that is never. Um, except for deliverance at the very beginning, well, my, I only had one bit of advice for you, and you nail it like 90%, 95% actually, whenever I'm writing the words, what I'm thinking, what I'm picturing it. So, yeah, this is kind of funny. This is the first time we've actually uh, talked. Um, I know. Person to person. <laughs> it's strange. And it's, of course, digital, so it adds that element too. So it's like, I've met you. <laughs> I know. Uh, I work a lot. Like, I know, like, some pretty deep, dark things from your imagination. <laughs> so, but I will say, you do uh, a great job of, in my recording scripts, which probably when you're rich and famous someday, someone will want a copy of it because you do leave little <laughs> notes for me in the script, like, Luke, don't suck at this one. This is important. Or, like, uh, I... Luke, you're here. Do this thing here. Or just a heads up. Uh, this is from the Batman. Michael Keaton. I'm like, do you yep. think I'm like from a different country? Like, why? Well, I, I know, <laughs> okay, I know the reference. I got it. But I appreciate it because it does, it helps a lot to have those kind of just little, little nudges. So you're good about that. And it helps it, when you do it on your own. Any collaboration is always welcome. Mm -hmm. I love it. It, it just yes. helps so much. Um, Justin Leslie, Justin S. Leslie, uh, reached out to me a long time ago whenever he was first getting started. I uh, you just published the first book, but much like myself, where I published the first one and then realized some changes that need to be made as I'm editing, I hooked him up with my editor, who was amazing, and, uh, and then he was asking about um, ACX and uh, how did I uh, manage to get you, and uh, uh, that's actually a fun story, I'll get to in a sec, but um, you know, I introduced you guys together, and uh, you know, and so you have um, uh, Max Abaddon of the Will, that's already out right now. Yep. And then um, the Purity Law, and, uh, which you already done. recorded that one. Yep. But it Sweet, I can't. Yeah, he's been, I've been really appreciative. And a lot of, so much of the work comes from the writing community that kind of shares people, which I've had that happen with other authors who have been generous enough to reach, you know, suggested. So it's always nice, too, and when it comes to the recommendation from somebody who's, you know, doing well in uh, knows what they're doing, that always makes it a safer bet. So, yeah, Max Abaddon, I encourage everybody to listen to that, especially if you like the greater natural problems. They have a kind of similar worlds. In fact, I think there could be crossovers. What's, what's funny is we did a, um, a short story collaboration called Simple Deeds, uh, where all the pros, uh, proceeds we donated to Wounded Warriors because he was a vet, uh -huh. and uh, Depp Wegg, uh, who's actually one of my best friends, is also a vet, so you know, felt right to donate the proceeds but in the in simple deeds one of his short stories actually says that he's sitting at a bar and he looks up and he sees a uh, a beanie guy with long black hair who just gave him the creeps and then he got up and left <laughs> wearing his trench coat and i was like hey oh that's fun that's fun so i think it was in book five or six i can't remember i think it, i think it's six yeah it is six uh holy shioli where um John's talking to someone, and uh, but she's from a different co country, and she refers to Sheol as, uh, you know, the Abaddon. And John's like, hey, I think I know someone with that name. That's right. Yeah. Max or yeah. something? Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it's just a one-off where he's like, that sounds familiar. Just, yeah. a little, just a little one of these for me. I love it. Those things are fun. It makes it fun, especially for fans. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and you guys have similar styles. They're, you know, it's humor wrapped around mysticism and the fantasy and the urban stuff so i love that genre this is it's a fun thing to get to. <laughs> so um yeah so i gave justin uh, some advice too on uh, you know what i do when um, working with you adding the notes to the word document and all that stuff and uh, hopefully that helped but um to get back to how we were first introduced um so I, I first heard about you from uh, the Iron Drew Chronicles, mm -hmm. right? So I, I read so slow, so I have to do audiobooks. And I used to travel a lot whenever I was a, a district manager for Sears and then a regional manager for a, a manufacturing company. So I would drive all over the place and I would just inhale books. So Iron Drew was one of those. You know, after Dresden, I was like, 
how am I going to find another series that's up there? And then, right. uh, you know, because James Marsters kills it. And yeah. then I found you and, you know, inhaled the series. And it was amazing. And then, uh, so it's you, James Marsters, uh, R.C. Bray. Uh, he's one of my all-time faves. And then Ray Porter. Yeah. Um, and McLeod Andrews, too. But uh, you guys are the ones that I, I buy the book, no matter what it is. So all actually, good um, guys, dude. They're all yeah. good guys and they're talented in their own way. I love it about the industry, too, because they're all so unique. Like a Ray Porter is a, nobody can be Ray Porter. You know what I mean? So I, I mm-hmm. love that kind of versatility and they're all so generous and nice to like everybody else in a really good way. So they're good guys. So good taste. You have good taste. <laughs> Except for McLeod Andrews. I need one. You can tell him it's that. <laughs> well, he, he, he never responded. <laughs> no, but, um, but McLeod said like, I always bust his balls. In fact, when I go to industry events and they make you sign a name tag, I always put McLeod Andrews. And put it on myself, and then just add like a complete <laughs> ass. <laughs> That's so funny. So uh, I'd actually reached out to RC Bray um, first because um, I didn't I didn't know about ACX, so I yeah. just went to his website and then I sent him an email, told him the story about you know John and uh, the promise I made, and he loved it. And uh, he read some of it. He saw the reviews. He actually made some. Uh, he made me change up a lot of stuff. Or he didn't make. He he suggested like the, the original cover. It it's so uh, it's so funny. The original cover was uh, basically a cartoon drawing of the animated series Batman, but it was of John um, wearing his trench coat and stuff with the lightning in the background. So it was uh, very yeah. heavily knocking on the door of copyright infringement. Uh, <laughs> so he's like, dude, uh, I hate to say it, you know, they say don't judge a book by its cover, but they people do. You need to change that. And then uh, so I did that. And then. Um, he got signed on with Podium or something, and he had a contract, so he was two years behind. And then he said uh, that he wanted to produce the book. Uh, and then he asked me, like, um, who did I want uh, to narrate? And I was like, well, my favorites are, and I listed in order, though. It was you, and it was, um, I think it was McLeod after that, just because he has that kind of, you know, Sam and Slim is one of my favorite series, too. And then it was uh, Ray Porter and then James. But I put James last because he was, you know, also. Uh, doing Dresden at the same time, and you had already wrapped up with the Iron Druid. So I, I told him uh, you first, and um, he told me what to do. So then I, I learned all about ACX, I gave him step by step instructions. Yeah, yeah no, I, most people haven't actually. I, I just gave like a brief thing, like RC Brady told me about you know how to get in touch with Luke. So then I messaged you on uh, ACX, and that's that's it. The rest is history. So and honestly, I'm. Just, I'm very happy that it went that way. You know, uh, I'm very much the believer of, um, you know, you, what you put out in the universe is what you pack and things are supposed to happen as long as you work for them. Uh, it was supposed to be you and I love R.C. Bray, but he's more the the um, sci-fi military-esque and he also does like horror books and stuff. And, and then you are, you've been perfect, honestly. Um, I can't well, I stop raving that. about how you are, you are John. We like do 95%. We do have Every fun. time I'm reading. <laughs> I love yeah, I tell- that humor and he's kind of abandoned and the ability to do it first person. You always get to have a little bit more uh, fun to delve in that, that deeply to somebody. So it's kind of all, the, the, to me, it's all good. That's a great, I didn't know about that. I'll have to say something to, to Bray, but um, yeah, the, the podium thing, I there's like a deal that went through and uh, yeah, it made it a little difficult, but you're, you're right about working hard because you didn't just message me i remember you did message me but you were pretty like you had your shit together if you've been doing this long enough you I get a lot of messages you know uh not trying to you know humble brag but kind of uh but but you actually show there's a, there's a difference when there's something to back it up and it seemed you had an enthusiasm that came through and you know the work you got to look and make sure it's actually readable but it seemed, you know, you got to call out the uh, one-offs and things like that. So kudos to you for coming across and doing, doing the right thing and handling it well. So, and no, thanks to Bray that. for pointing in the right direction because now it's my uh, my pleasure to get to do it. Uh, yeah, man, I, I appreciate that. Um, my wife says I need to write a book and how to write a book. Uh, all the research I did, all the countless hours and, and uh, courses and, you know, I went to writers' conferences and uh, countless, countless, countless YouTube videos. I even subscribed to Masterclass. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I learned from Neil Gaiman. Um, he he gave some amazing advice. And then, um, 
you know, people ask all the time, what's the best advice you can give for anyone trying to you know, bust in the writing? Is do it. Yeah. 90, 90 but you got to be a hustler. And that, not everybody's a hustler. They're, they may be a writer, they may be creative, but the business part is what eats people alive. And so I think seeing somebody that has the ability to kind of be savvy with the business part, and you also know you got to spend money to make money, which is oh, yeah. a thing. So I think there's a lot of. Um, Maturity that comes through in that, as far as being a business thing. I've got a good what? gaming story for you, though. Know, talking about oh, yes. Brag. Um, I love you. I'd always been a fan of his, and I saw him once speak in Cleveland, like a decade or so, a long time ago, and asked a question because I knew he narrated audiobooks, and I was like a very beginning audiobook narrator, and he was gracious enough to answer it very well. And then uh, I went to my first Audis Award. Uh, which is uh, kind of the yearly Oscar for Audis, or for uh, audiobooks. And he's kind of heavily with audiobook stuff. He's been kind of instrumental. He's both fantastic. Mm. He just did that uh, Sandman. <laughs> uh, no, but so, so yeah, so Neil Gaiman was at the Audi Awards, my first Audi Awards, I think it was 2012. And he was either hosting or presenting. And I was so starstruck. Like, I was like flop sweating, New York City, tuxedo. <laughs> Just drenched, just disgust. Like the kind of person you would want to avoid if you've ever seen him. And I was literally stalking him around this big, like, metropolitan museum area where they were having it, like, creepily stalking him. And at one point, I was close enough to him that I was, like, trying to make my, you know, you're, like, waiting for a big gap to, like, <laughs> sleech up and be like, I want to suck everything. So, and, but anyway, so I go up. And there's a girl standing there on the outskirts, too. And I'm like, oh, she must be the same. She's trying to get close to Neil. That's like, you know, I'm like, and she's like, what are you here for? And I'm like, oh, I'm an audio producer. I'm so excited to see Neil. It's so great. And she's like, oh, yeah. And I was like, I was like, do you know him? And she's like, I'm his wife. <laughs> it was Amanda Palmer. Who, if you know, like, she's a fucking badass, legit, like, amazing person. And I was just like, cool, good for you. Like, Oh, it just totally fell. And then I met him. He was very nice. But, but I totally <laughs> felt like she went back and I met him. She's like, did you see that really tall, sweaty guy? And he's like, yeah, what was all we did? What did he even Like, just... <laughs> Oh, that's funny. And Amanda um, Palmer stole this because she was in, she was barefoot inside this metropolitan with like a backpack on. Like as if she might just take off and go. <laughs> She's so wild. So, yeah, that's my good thing. Uh, one time, I, I would love to work. His stuff's amazing. I, yeah, I have Sandman. Uh, great series. Or great book, I mean. Um, actually, he talked about Sandman uh, in the master class. And I learned about the left page turn for paperback. You know, if you have a big reveal, it needs to be on the left page because the mind's, you know, your eye will sneak to try and spoil it for you. Yeah. So that was actually pretty cool. That's so smart. I mm. never think what a craft little tidbit that's really right. Helpful. Yeah, <laughs> that um, makes perfect sense though. It's very cool. So no, that's a, that's a really that's a funny story. Oh, by the way, uh, I did uh, nominate you for or us, I suppose, for um, a shadow of a doubt for the Audis. Uh, I keep checking the website like at least you know once every couple of weeks to see if they have any. Uh, have Nothing yet. I don't, I don't know how the process works, but shadow of a doubt. Uh, you know, people ask me what's my favorite book, and it, it's Shadow of a Doubt. Um, mostly because, um, for those who don't know, book one uh, was written just for me. You know, uh, most people by now know the story that you know I wrote the series for my best friend, who made me promise to write a book about him, as, and then he wanted to be a vampire because we grew up reading Anne Rice, and then he passed away uh, in a car wreck, um, and. Uh, uh, left me with the, you know, I had, I, I promised. So then I sat down and I wrote it. I thought I was the only one who was ever going to see it. And, uh, um, and then my, you know, I gave it to some of my closest friends, like Valenta, who's in the story, Dustin Valenta, Jonathan Depweg, you know, he's in the story. I gave it to them. And uh, Valenta was like, a, dude, I was going to tell you it's good, you know, because you're, you know, you're my buddy and stuff, but damn, dude, it's really good. You need to do something. That's so, so um, cool. I mean, yeah, I published it. And the reason why it's so full of major obscure uh, movie references, that's how John and I talked. You know, like um, Bob Peck from uh, Jurassic Park saying Clever Girl. You know, uh, we would we would say that all the time if one of us did something funny or stupid or, you know, Clever Girl. Yeah. So, uh, it's so full of movie quotes. Now, uh, 
and, and I love that, but I wrote it just for me. So book two, though, I knew people were going to read, so I, I uh, streamlined it and toned some uh, the ultra obscure ones down. But then book three is where uh, my editor, my beta readers, and even myself, I, uh, we all agreed that's where I found my voice. And, uh, you know, the series arc, the arc really starts taking off. But, um, yeah, so I, I nominated you for the Audis uh, on that one, and I, I really hope you hear something from it, because that, that book, man, there's some parts in there. You know, I had to play for, you know, Deathwick in the car at one point, uh, on that one part in, in the prison, and I was like, dude, was he really just crying, or is he just that good? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you, you nail it, dude. You, oh, you nail I appreciate it. that. I mean, and I love any time I write about puppies. To do that, to, to, to kind of um, elevate your friend, but also, whoever, mm. you know, as a person who he was. Uh, although I have, I have a feeling he's probably gotten a lot of laughs after mm. the fact, watching you struggle through this shit and being like, oh, oh yeah. man, I never thought he fucking knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, probably, no. Probably a lot of joy upstairs to, to, to get to see, watch you do this, but then also see it blow up and, and be really, um, really worthwhile and great. I mean, what a, what a cool honor to have. So good for you, man. I tip my hat to you. It's crazy. Um, uh, first, I love whenever I write about puppies. I just want to jump back to that because I could tell that you're like me and you're maybe more so that you love because you just get into it whenever I mention puppies. It's puppies so funny. So much better. Well, it's also because it's funny because what you did is you make this like disgusting, like the like he's John is really the worst, the worst in a lot of ways. But when it comes to a puppy, he's just like melted butter. So I thought that was a really funny uh, juxtaposition to lean into. But you're right, I, I, I am that way. I get it. Like I've always had dogs, dogs are terrible people in my opinion. Um, I have one right like, here. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but I thought that was such a funny thing that he could be so cutthroat and bloodthirsty and make bad choices. But if there's a dog there. That it's just like, whoa, be, you, be, you, whoa, 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 you know, like fucking, that's great. That's brilliant. Um, so to get back to um, keeping him alive and stuff, it's so weird. Um, I, like we were talking before we started recording uh, about Friendsgiving and stuff, and how you might join us on one. Um, yeah, sure. I'd love to. One of the things they do is a, is a costume contest, a cosplay. And, uh, you know, I was one of the judges because they had the authors as the judges. And uh, for the for the, we had to do a virtual for 2020 for obvious reasons. So people submitted their videos, and I had no idea what was coming. But one of them, but I remember Brian, um, Brian, and then um, uh, there's an, oh, now I feel bad. I forget the other guy's name, uh, just because it was so like overwhelming. But the video came up, and a dude's wearing a trench coat and a beanie, and I'm like. I, I watched the video again of Friendsgiving and my reaction, because, uh, you know, I do this all the time because I have the screen up here, but, you know, I try and look at the camera. So just in the video, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it was so, it was so weird. And then I showed it to Dustin because it was me, Dustin and John were like the trio best friends. Um, uh, and I showed it to him when, at, at my birthday party which was like a couple months after Friendsgiving. I showed him the video and I was watching it and I was just waiting. And then when it when the guy came up and it was, he was dressed as John, just to see Dustin go like, um, it, it, was, it was so surreal is the word I'm getting at. It was so surreal uh, to see that. And now um, uh, one of my fans got a tattoo of the uh, Beard and Beanie logo. Oh, uh, on his wrist, and I and I sent that to Dustin too, and, and we we're both just like, "What is going on?" Right, it's so surreal. But what a like, I mean, it, it, I think it definitely resonates with people. I think it definitely you know captures something. But it's got to be a mind fuck to see that, mm. you know? Yeah, <laughs> it is. But at the same time, I I, I love it because um, you know he'll he'll live on forever, which is really cool. Exactly. And uh, I, I can imagine him, though. I know him because we were the same person for the most part. I can just imagine him, like, uh, standing next to me in ghost form and, like, punching my arm lightly and just being like, use my death to get famous, huh? Yeah. But, he, then, but then he'd be like, 
you know, he'd be secretly really proud and honored and humbled that all, you know, thousands and thousands of people know his name. Right. And it, it, it's, yeah, it's just so weird. But speaking of writing for Catharsis, um, you have your uh, your book that you wrote and produced and narrated, of course, uh, that's out on Audible. Is it Audible Plus? Yeah, uh, it's Audible. They keep changing the name. Uh, right. Audible Originals now. Mm. Um, and Audible Plus. Yeah, I think it's like, it's part of their free package. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I got to do a memoir about uh, my son uh, that passed, uh, who was also a vampire. And <laughs> I always like to throw a joke in after mentioning child death because people you yeah. really you really call the audience for the kind of your people or not. But uh, unfortunately, I had a, a son born with a lot of um, you know uh, issues, health issues, and we struggled for 21 months uh, with him, and he finally passed. This is about five years ago now, and um, I was lucky enough to get a chance to kind of put it into. An audiobook form, which I think is really cool because he uh, could never speak or make a lot of sounds because he had a lot of um, lung and throat issues. Uh, so it's kind of like a way to give him, just like you're talking about with John and keeping him alive, uh, a way to keep him alive through, again, audiobook sound story, um, which I think is the most magical of you know forms of communication. Um, because that music really is so transportive. And so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just am so excited because it's called Unspoken. You can get it on Audible, um, but it is free, which is nice because um, that means it's accessible to so many more people. And, uh, yeah, it was fucking hard as shit to write, um, but it was very helpful. Um, and it also came at a good time where it was four years after that I started writing it. Um, so I was still a fucking, you know, nutcase with grief, but I was definitely in a place where I could handle it a little bit more. Um, and I do feel like there is something important about memorializing those that we love and have passed on with their stories and using those to connect other people and keep their name alive. I mean, that's the biggest thing to me, and I'm sure why you named the main character John was the most important thing is saying the person's name. And my yeah. favorite question, uh, and, and to give anyone a tip if you're dealing with someone who, you know, drops a bomb on you, like, oh yeah, I had a son die. Everyone goes, oh shit, what do I say? What do I say? <laughs> uh, the best thing is what's their name? Uh, because then you get to say their name. That's a way to continue their story. Yeah. So, so his name was Finnegan, and I'm sure John and Finnegan are both up there doing this, like these fucking assholes treading all <laughs> over our memory, getting famous on our coattails, you know. <laughs> so, God bless. But yeah, I love it. I'm very lucky. So, unspoken, check it out. I appreciate the the tip. For those of you who um, haven't read it yet, I'll put a link in the description um, where you can download or you can go right to Audible if you already have an Audible membership. It should be free to listen. And it's, uh, I think it's four hours long? Three and a half. Three and a half, yeah. So uh, it's a uh, good read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, some of those stories are really funny. Though. You have some funny stories in there. Um, like the one with your um, uh, uh, Thanksgiving dinner and the old and the week old turkey. Oh, uh, God oh my bless goodness. my grandma, who I love. My favorite, though, is the quote from her. Uh, if it's not one goddamn thing, it's nothing. I say that to myself. Every fucking day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's fun stuff in it too. It's not all this long. So I think you did the same thing. It's when we want to remember these people, we don't want to just remember them as like sad mm-hmm. that they passed. That's such a small part of our existence. That it's better to do the to bring life to it, you know, instead of dwelling on it. So I, that's what I try to do. I appreciate that you, you listen to. It. Thank you. Oh yeah. No, well, I mean. You know, for obvious reasons, uh, we're, we're as we were saying before. You know, uh, we're, we're in that special club. You know, writing books about those we've lost. Yeah, the the, the club. Well, just losing someone. It's the club nobody ever wants to be part of, but everybody. Wants to be part of. So, yeah, um, anyone who's even lost a pet or, or you know loved one, friend, it, iguana. Yeah, it's, it's anything that you love. Uh, actually, I wrote a book, or not a book. Well, I guess it is. But on the way to John's um, uh, 
Um, we call it a celebration of life instead of a funeral. Right. But I wrote uh, My Red Balloon, which is on my YouTube channel. I actually had uh, one of my friends who also was friends with John uh, Bo, um, animate or not animate, he drew all the pictures for it. He's a talented, talented artist um, and photographer. But we actually, uh, I put it together, animated it, and put it on YouTube. It's very basic. Um, I could probably go back and clean it up now, but it's about a child who has a red balloon on his wrist and he's out playing with it and it's his favorite thing that's ever existed because he's so young. Then he loses it and uh, he has to deal with the pain and everyone else is looking at the child who's screaming and crying. They don't understand. You know, they understand why, but they can't feel what he feels and, uh, and all that. So it's, it's, I, I, there's one part I crack, or not crack it, I, uh, I lose it every time. It's where you, uh, um, God basically comes down as an old man is talking to the boy about how, you know, the balloon is in a better place now and he's, he's getting to fly. He's on his own adventure. And the boy's like, um, you know, but I didn't get to say goodbye. Mm. Uh, uh, no. Right. You do some push-ups. Yeah. Uh, just every time with that part, I'm just like, man, that's just so hard. But it, it's important. Well, this, the, the books are your goodbye. The books are, mm. you know, that's that kind of thing. You're, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful memory to elevate it past just something you know mundane oh yeah and the story is really great too um you know how he's growing and and the ending uh you're one of the very very few people who know the ending and you know, i had to tell you in the beginning so we could put in those little nuances for later on right. but um the ending is going to be in my opinion perfect um it's i can't i can't wait to write the end so we're you know, at the end of book 12, though, people are going to burn. So we've got, I'm, I'm like a book behind you. And uh, I know books. You're, you're, you need to flip and slow down because I'm trying so hard. My, I would like nothing more in 2021 to release an audio concurrently with the print, but you write so damn fast. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're at five. I've recorded five. Six. I've six just came out. Six and then. Seven is, I think, in pretty soon. Next month. Actually. Yeah, a couple weeks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to release this video on YouTube um, on February 2nd, which is the same day that Book 7 comes out in print. Yeah. And then you're set to record it uh, the middle of February, so I'm guessing yeah. with ACX and Audible. Um, I mean, it's like a late March. Good. I will say that we've got a good a streamline system. Oh, yeah. They tend to come out pretty quick, but you're going to have to, yeah, I would say it's going to be a month. But in a way, maybe people get their chance to read it, and then they get to relive it and listen to it, so we'll go for that. But I'm going to catch up, but you got to slow down. That's all I was saying. <laughs> well, technically, at this moment, you're caught up. I'm almost I, caught up. I'm I will you, say this, I'm though. Um, uh, what, you know, which is awesome. Um, thank goodness for Argento. Um, is uh, you know they get to pay the bill now, but I will say this: um, whenever I get those files, I'm always so excited. I you know I tell my wife and friends and stuff. It's like, no, everyone leave me alone. You know, I just go. I sit in my chair, um, no computer on. I put my phone down so I don't want to fiddle with it, and I just listen. You know, it takes me about two, maybe three days to finish um, a book, and I just listen to it straight. But man, like uh, I am my own biggest fan because of how you deliver it because writing it is one thing right because yeah. i'm seeing it from twenty thousand feet up kind of thing uh thank god i have an editor that catches the small nuance stuff that i miss uh, she's awesome but um uh you know reading it is one thing but then whenever i hear it and especially your performance i'm just I, i'm so excited whenever those come out it's it's amazing let's just do a another pump for editors in general if you are involved in the writing Oh, you my understand God. the importance of an editor and they're the like unsung heroes behind the scenes but oh my god everyone needs an editor i don't care if you're stephen king or you're anybody like you need somebody else to help and so it always pays off i can tell uh it, it just it's that oh, yeah. next step up and it's also what we were talking about earlier hustling and doing the stuff to the legwork to make it legit so so one of the questions you, i get editors, yeah, yes. One of the questions I always get is, um, you know, becoming a writer, what was the thing that surprised you the most? Uh, being an indie writer, that is, you got to have the money to pay an editor. Because uh, I, I used Fiverr, the, you know, the service yeah. you know, where you pay a fee. And I went through two or three editors and they just, you know, people kept finding mistakes and it was messed up. And uh, 
Um, then I finally did something called the Editor Games. I was like, screw this, I'm I'm gonna find the right one. So then I uh, I wrote Deliverance, you know, the novella point zero five. Yep. And uh, I I reached out to five editors who were highly rated on Fiverr and said, I don't care what your fee is, uh, I'm gonna pay it, but just know that you're going up against four others, and the winner is gonna get to be my editor for the rest of the series. So I sent it out. And one of them came back. You know how John has the Fortress of Solitaire, which is obviously an ironic, childish call out to uh, Superman's Fortress of Solitude. What? Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> so this editor changed it. She thought I misspelled Solitude to Solitaire and made it Solitude. I was like, okay, nope, next. So uh, <laughs> Fabiola actually caught something. Um, in in um, Deliverance, John is... Uh, talking about a band. It was Demu Borgir, which is one of my favorite metal bands. Uh, but the book takes place in 1990. And I only mentioned that once in the very beginning. And so uh, Daw says, like, uh, you look like a roadie for that metal band you keep going on about. And the Swedish one. He's like, oh, Demu Borgir? I love those guys. And then she report came back and said, they weren't formed until 91, by the way. Damn! And I was like, I should have known that. Well, oh, okay, right. we have a winner! So I changed it to Opeth, which was formed in 90, I believe. Um, so she won, and she has saved me over and over again. And book six was the biggest one. She caught some stuff about the, um, you know, because uh, we're getting into theoretical physics territory with the different planes of existence and uh, higher dimensions. And uh, I've been watching so many YouTube videos on this stuff, and it's just making my, my brain want to bleed. But uh, she brought she brought up some stuff uh, that didn't make sense or didn't flow, or she said, by the way, if if he could do it this way, uh, why didn't he do that in book three, four, and five? And I was like, oh, shit. So then I had to come up with logical, scientific reasons why, and it finally worked. But man, after book six, uh, I, I couldn't... I had already written like a third of book seven whenever she, find, she got the edits back to me. And after I spent almost a week going back and forth and fixing it, and we got it right, I couldn't touch book seven for like another three or four weeks, which is actually book seven was supposed to come out uh, in January uh, or late December, but I just, I couldn't touch it for a while. My brain was empty. I just needed to chillax for, for a minute. But editors, uh, editors, if anyone out there who wants to start writing, you need a good editor. That's yeah. probably the best advice. Yeah, it really sure. is. And in, it's lucky because in book seven now, uh, every, there's a world of events and everything goes back to just being like no technology, so then you don't have to worry about theoretical physics or anything like that. You mm. should be like, John went to a coffee shop. He had some coffee. <laughs> it's delicious. And over and out oh. of beer. Like, just simplify, you know. Even now, I'm like, dude, this is getting out there. I'm like, I don't like shit's out there. But it all, for me so far, it's it's the rules of the world are withholding, which is yeah, what the you series, have to do in fantasy. My series should now be dubbed Urban sci-fi instead of just urban fantasy. Urban uh, fantasy. Sci fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sci fantasy. Hey, I like sci fantasy. That. Here we go. Coined it. That's Here. it. All right. <laughs> you heard it here, um, folks. Oh, so check it out. I found it. This is the original cover for book one. I kind I'm of glad you did. I yeah, like but the simplistic tone of it. The, the, the print could be better but the actual oh yeah artwork no. is great. um yeah i have this one sealed because uh this thing has over like 200 grammatical errors and it, <laughs> it just fabiola went and fixed all of them my editor yeah. but um actually I, I sold i only had 10 of these and i sold nine of them for uh, surprisingly pretty many good um, but you know people really wanted that original ultra mega limited edition like there's only a few in existence basically and then uh, I forgot I had this too. So actually, I, I uh, met Kevin Hearn okay. at the um, Third Eye Bookstore. Yeah. And, and he signed it. I know he signed it. I forgot where he signed it. But yeah, yeah Kevin Hearn, actually, I, I talked to him. I talked to him for a little bit and he gave me some. Oh, there it is. No, I have this one. But yeah, we talked in person for a little bit. Super nice guy. Uh, you know, people talk to me all the time. Oh, there it is. Poor Hunter. Yep. You know, people talk to me all the time about, you know, how cool it is that I respond to them, that I, you know, answer every email and, or a message. And I tell them, you know, uh, R.C. Gray, um, 
and Luke and or yeah, Luke and you and um, uh, Kevin Hearn. You know, all these people who responded to me. I remember how that made me feel and how it solidified the fandom. So I make sure to answer. You know, anyone and everyone who reaches out. Yeah, Kevin is the king of that. He's so like generous. He's very good. He's very good with that stuff, but very funny. And uh, yeah, yeah, he's kind of like the Godfather right now of urban fantasy, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, he's great. Uh, uh, and it's funny you got so you got a book uh, at Poison Pen in Arizona, right? No, no, that one was a Third Eye oh, in Houston. In Houston. Yeah, I've yeah. been there. It wasn't the one I was at there. Because I did, he no. had done several signings, but I did fly down to Houston once and did a signing with him. Oh, man. <laughs> it was before we started working there. Because you would have oh, okay. known it was before we started working there. It was a while ago. But yeah, that's a great, great bookstore. And Houston, I'd never mm-hmm. been to Houston before, but it was super cool. I love it. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so, some questions from fans. Um, I, I know you get these all the time, but um, uh, how did you get started in uh, narrating? I was at a crossroads one night, and there was a kind of weird goat-like man, and he was like, what do you want? <laughs> and I was like, I want to be a famous audiobook narrator. He's like, it's done. And now I just don't have a soul. <laughs> Is it supernatural rules where you have 10 years? Joke's on him. That rat is old to begin with. Oh! (laughs) Um, I work, so my brother, James Daniels, is an audiobook narrator from the back in the tape days, like the 90s. I always like saying that because it makes him seem like he's like some ancient Larry King guy. (laughs) Um, But he, uh, he worked for a company in Michigan that is now owned by Amazon. They're one of the first companies in the 70s to come up with audiobook tape technology, which remember back in the day, they said, please turn over to listen to side two and flip the tape and you can listen to it again. They were able to do these double-sided tapes. They became huge. Anyways, nobody cares. They've already clicked on to TikTok. But the point is, he made an introduction to a casting director. I was an actor at the time, and I sent a auditioned to her from my kitchen table in my parents' house of me narrating um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and something from like Nicholas Sparks to show variety. And uh, I lucked out, she liked it, I came down. And so I worked for several years in a studio system, which was a, a big area that had a bunch of different uh, recording studios, it was a big company and stuff like that. And then I've moved exclusively pretty much to the home studio, which mm-hmm. again, thank God, because I mean, the whole business moved that direction about six years ago. Um, I got in about 10 years ago, and six years ago, everything just started shifting to home studios because of the overhead and people can record from home. But I was lucky because when I started, it was very much like I had an engineer, I had a director, you had a casting director. You had the writer, and you had me. So it was like this huge thing. Now it's like I'm in here just like (laughs) ranking off half the time. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, speaking of actor, um, so when it comes time for who flicks, or uh, I guess (sighs) I'm so pissed. Most of my predictions have come true. Electric Hummer, um, there's a show on uh, Amazon uh, where future where people can upload their brains to like this server uh it was a great great series i know what you're talking it's only one season yeah but uh at one point like they're they hold their hands like this and the screen comes out and i was like hey uh, wait a sec i always like that i thought that was really good one it's an icon- icon- iconic gesture and you want those kind of visuals in writing that kind of pop out and it's so it makes sense you know what I mean? It's very logical. I could see that happen. So I guarantee you, you that's where we're going to go. Um, and then um, Elon Musk, Starlink. But I'd, ar- I'd already read that I heard he was planning on that anyway, so I didn't really predict that one. But um, um, So now it's Disney bought Hulu. Yeah, Hulu. So it's uh, Who Dis. <laughs> Is, uh, it's instead of Who Flick. So anyway, whenever, they, uh, whenever Netflix comes calling... Um, you know, I want to make an argument that either myself 
before you played John in the series. So uh, I have to ask, uh, would you be down to do that? Uh, to play John in a Netflix series? I'm like, no, dude, no. I don't want to be famous. That would suck. <laughs> I don't want to be obscure. I like no I always hate that shit. Like, I just want to be able to do my art without people recognizing it and paying money. Like, no, I want all of these things. Yeah, no, it'd be fun. It'd be fun. I'd have to throw this back out, though. I think right? we're better for now. I mean, Jesus. I'm looking yeah, except at for all these grays and stuff I'm getting. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'd be funny. great. It'll, come, it'll happen. We'll see. Uh, my brother no, writes sure. TV, but uh, <laughs> he always makes a joke about it because I'm always pitching him stuff. And he's like, dude, nobody wants to make fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> he's um, like, nobody, they're not pitch me a cop show. I'm like, oh, I don't want to see a cop show. He's like, that's all they'll make. <laughs> uh, or reality in the game. The house for the big show. Yeah. Um... Yeah, there's there might be some things in the works, but it's gonna take. I already know. Like even if um, even if they brought a contract like right now, uh, it would take. Wait, how long did it take Artemis Fowl? Ten years, and then they butchered it. And so that's the only thing I'm worried about. Uh, I hope to be involved if they do, because you know Anne Rice interview with the vampire is a classic, and it's true to the books because she wrote the screenplay. You know, uh, and then they did Queen of the Damned, and it was just a, a, a fucking dumpster. Uh, fire because she wasn't involved at all, wasn't the main character, so I hope to be involved in the series uh, somehow, but uh, I, I know it's going to happen sooner, or probably later than sooner, but it'll probably happen. I believe in it, man. Just like you said, you know, you gotta put it out there and make it happen. Hustle I think the Nate way. Temple... I, anyone can do it, Hunter, I believe you can. Oh, yes. So you've got the hustle. He's got the hustle in him. Like, I can see it, you know? That's good. I like it. I guess that comes from so, yeah, it comes from always being like a district manager, a regional manager for different companies, responsible for thousands of employees and hundreds of millions of dollars. But then I also own my own supplement store, which I recently sold so I can focus on uh, being a writer full time. Um, uh, so yeah, like for anyone out there, no one's going to give you anything. You got to go out and get it. Um, you know, the wife and I are trying to buy rental properties and all this other stuff. Uh, you got to plan for the future. Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Ask. Um, how long does it take you to narrate the typical novels? The ratio tends to be 60 minutes sitting in here equals 30 minutes of recorded usable audio. Oh, wow. A one-to-one ratio. Now, some people are better and some people are slower, but that's, that's the very mean. You know, like, if you can get... 40 minutes in a 60 minute session, you're fucking, you're just kneeling. If you get enough. 50 minutes in a 60 minute session, you are a, you're dick hill. If you get, <laughs> yeah, so uh, 30 to 60 is generally the ratio. Um, wow. So That's I awesome. try to do a book a week, which would be 8 to 10 hours. But um, as I get older and I've done it more, that go, when I was young, I could get through. And I was also working in a studio with help which makes the process go faster. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. if I was in the studio with an engineer and stuff, we could definitely get like 40 or 50 minutes out of an hour. But at home, 30 minutes an hour. That's that's the best I can hope for. What is your process whenever, because I know Troy um, handles all the most of the post-production, but how does it work for uh, whenever you are doing your lines and you have to, what's your process? Uh, standard is a punch and roll. So that means I'm talking to you and the I've, farted in my mouth, I stop, I go back three seconds to where before I farted in my mouth, and I pick up at a clean spot, it's nice, and then when I hit that, it starts to play, I record until I go and fart in my mouth again. Then I go back and I listen to the first one, make sure that transition's clean, and then I clean, so you're you're cleaning it as you go, and then when you're done, you have a chapter that has no mistakes in it. Um, oh, cool. They both work. Uh, I do think the punch and roll is faster. Is a faster, more efficient way to work. 
um, because then you're not having to listen back to everything. And mm. what if you didn't click it? Or what if there was a big loud noise from you yelling a line? So then you're listening to that. It's just more piecemeal. It's better to do it and make it clean as you go. So when you finish the chapter, the chapter is done. And even doing that, I still make mistakes all the time. If it's a false start. Sometimes I will. If I say, like, you know, I've just made a mistake and I start, da 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 I fucked up. I'll jump right and start again so I don't have to do it. And then sometimes mm. I forget about that. And then that's get caught in the post production where they listen and they go, well, he tried to start again. But, mm. um, I don't mean that. But yeah, no, the, the, uh, I do a bunch of old techniques, and, uh, um, Pro Tools, audio recording platform, and it seems to work out. You know, that's interesting. Actually, I do a similar writing style. Um, uh, some people say they do a, you know, they sprint, where the person will just sit down and they just type without pausing. And, uh, you know, if, for example, as they'll say, he said, he said, he said, he said, he said, yeah. you know, they don't care about the nuances. Or I say, you know, he articulated, he grumbled, he groaned, he moaned, you know, uh, he whispered. I do it as I write for the same thing that you just said. So whenever I go back to do the second draft, I only have to do this much work. And so You've already this done much the work. second draft. So it's more like the third draft. Perfect. Yeah. So that, that's why we have the, the same style on that one. Yeah, I just think it makes sense. But now I get if I'm doing something. But then it, again, if I'm on a roll and I've got two minutes in and I make a mistake, I have to stop because I'm thinking about the fact that I just made a mistake, and so the next parts are messed up. So it just it just seems to be a cleaner, smoother way to get that flow that you want that book to have, as if I was just reading it to you. And I was that good. That I could make mm -hmm. mistakes. So no, that's awesome. I, I never I didn't know that. Um, I've always wondered what kind of mic do you use? You have a really nice looking mic. It's, um, this is a, yeah, it's not that nice. It's an SE 4400A. SE is a company. 4400A is the brand. Um, it's a very standard, so for vocal, the audio stuff is very different than if you're recording a band, especially because I have a very small contained soundproof booth. So it's very sensitive. Some, Really expensive mics are super sensitive, and then you can pick up every little thing. I like this one. It's an SE4400. Um, it's not. I think it's probably a couple hundred bucks. Um, with this kind of stuff, you don't need to spend a two thousand dollars on a on a mic. Most mics are actually pretty good. The the one I worked with before was a Rode NT1A. In my opinion, that's the like beginner's quintessential mic. It's great sound, you know, good bass, um, but the mics, you don't need to spend $2,000 to have a, a quality workable mic. But I would also, you know, I, I don't know much about Blue Yeti or those guys. There's like a difference. There's a great company called Sweetwaters, and they have people that will tell you everything you need to know, and they have free customer support as far as like technical so if you get your mic and you're like, I got my mic, there's some sad set that will sit there and talk to you about how to plug the fucking thing in. Sweetwater? So, yeah, Sweetwaters. Waters. Yep, Sweetwaters. Uh, they're an electric company. They do, I'm um, an you know, electronic company, but they do a lot of music stuff, but they also have a great, um, they know about audiobooks. There's a ton of people using their equipment. And I love the place. They're cheap, I'm like, inexpensive. Um, but their equipment's great, and they come with, you can call any time if you order a for them, and they will talk to you about tech support. Which, when you're a rube like me, it's, I, I'm not a tech guy. I'm not at all. I, I, I'm the guy that's like, I want to play with flowers. And, you know what I mean? Like, I need <laughs> someone else to be like, stop. Stop being a douche, and just do what you're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's great. Sweetwater, so for any of you budding narrators out there. Check out sweetwaters.com. They're great. Ask for Paul yeah. Leah. Tell him I say. Paul Leah is great. It's a great guy. Well, now, now you need to get like an affiliate link from him so they can pay you. Oh, shit. They, I don't need <laughs> anything from them. They send stuff like within a day. Like it's two oh, wow. day because they know people's shit's crash and they do stuff right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're legit. Go through a good company like that. You'll find some good stuff. And they'll tell you too. You're like, I've got this two by three space. I'm trying to do this stuff. They're like, well, what about this? What's your budget? 
They're good people. So I've always wondered, uh, it seems like most audiobook people uh, just swelter in their booths. Uh, there's, I guess, for the sound, there's no, no way to get any air conditioning in there. <laughs> Actually, when you're... You have to have ventilation. I don't care if it makes your sound. It's got high. If you work in a non-ventilated place, you can die. So ventilation is key. Uh, the booth I have actually has a ventilation system. Um, I don't know if we can see it, but above me, oh, that cool. right there. And then you can't see it, but below me, there is an actual unit that pumps, cycles air through the place. I oh, worked in an unfinished basement for my first couple of years, and uh, after an hour, I swear to God, I was like clicking frogs. Like, I was running around just like, I feel like, great. Like, it's <laughs> just you need to have to have ventilation. You, especially because you're talking for two hours, so you're just expelling carbon. So, yes, please, if this is a public service announcement, let everyone know. If you're working, get yourself some ventilation. Um, I'm lucky that the one I have is very quiet, so it doesn't mm -hmm. mess with my audio very much. And I have it set. I actually had it set to a higher rate so that I could get more fresh air. And my editor, Troy, was like, yeah, I'm noticing a little bit of extra sound in your room. I'm like, I just want to be able to breathe. So I clanked it down just one notch. He's like, yep, yeah, it's perfect. I'm like, how do these guys know? Like, they, they have this. That's like an editor. You need an engineer. These guys have mm -hmm. talent and skills that we don't have. Yeah, Troy's been he's been awesome. He's very quick whenever I have suggestions no, or anything. You guys not are amazing. amazing. He's, uh, he's a golden fleece. That's what I say. He's my golden fleece. <laughs> awesome. Uh, how many hours a day do you uh, work in the booth? Um, there's the real answer and there's the answer I probably want to say, but... Um, I would say three to four, three to four. Uh, I try to get an hour and a half to two hours of audio a day, mm. but there's definitely days where I get an hour or a half an hour. I have kids um, and teenagers, and they're horrible. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with my output. I just want to blame them for something. They, they have really, they stay in the room. They don't come down to us for food. I have no problem with them, but I just thought I'd shift focus away from my non productivity. When I was young, when I started out, I could do two books in a week. I would do um, five hours sometimes of audio a day, uh, 10 hours of booth. I would just crank. They call me the uh, steel ass because I'd just sit in the chair and never take a break. Can't do that anymore. I broke myself. So mm. about four hours. Man, that's crazy. Um, so how are the bloopers uh, turning out uh, for you? Because I, I know that you started doing them for other series too. It's uh, funny. We had talked about it. Like a few years ago, I, I did a couple bloopers just offhandedly, and I posted them randomly on Facebook. It's just a fun fan thing. Like here's mm -hmm. some funny bloopers. And then within the last two years, everybody wants bloopers. <laughs> Mm. Um, again, not to be mistaken, that was another humble brag on my part. Um, but yeah, no, like, um, Podium started asking for them, and I do a ton of work for them. They're fantastic, great, great company. Um, and so they started asking, like, it's funny. And I was like, how much? And they're like, nothing. And I was like, so, uh, I, I, but I try to keep a little list of them as I go. But they, mm. I've noticed it's harder and harder. Because so many of my bloopers are the same. It's me just being like, fuck goddamn, fuck shit. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, that's only so funny the first time you hear it. Like, so it's become more of a hunt and peck challenge. It's something where, it, you know, maybe I crack up in a part like it makes me laugh and I can't go on or something like that. But, but I, I enjoy it. I'm still that. waiting for one of those. I do think that there's a way of like, it, it, it helps kind of, especially at the end of a long book. Like, wow, that was eight hours of the guy talking, and then you listen, you know, oh, okay, so, yeah, he fucks up all the time. Like, it helps humanize him. I think they're funny. I, I love listening to them. It's actually the first thing I listen to whenever I get the files. Just, they're, they're so damn funny. Justin has been taking to, like, putting them to, like, fat beats to 
where I'm like, this could be playing in the club. Like, it's dope. <laughs> he, he put him to these. And then the last time he said to me, he's like, I have three different beats for you just pick which one you want. I'm like, they're all like great. Like, I don't know. Like, he's coming up with multiple songs. Like, it's pretty good. He's, yeah, he's, he's one of those, um, you know, I, I, I've been happy to help him out any way that he asked. But he, he was just like me. You know, doing it all himself. He has another full-time job. Hustling. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, so, I love helping people who help themselves. Uh, right. You gotta see some effort, you know. Oh, yeah. Now, he's he's gonna get up there, too. Uh, I'm very excited for him. I'm actually um, halfway or two-thirds through uh, the, uh, the first Max. Yep. Um, and, yeah, like, once again, you know, your, your performance uh, makes any book just... Like an experience, and it's so awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. They're fun All to right, do. So, They're fun to do. So with the, those wonderful toys coming out on uh, February 2nd, uh, people seem to notice a pattern that I like to do Batman quotes uh, for my, my books. And a uh, fun fact for those of you who don't know, um, in the movie, uh, Jack Nicholson actually says, does he get those wonderful toys? But everyone thinks it's where does he get those wonderful toys? Because actually, it was in the commercial. He says, "Where do we? Where does he get those wonderful toys?" But uh, if you listen, I have it on my phone. I watch the movie regularly. We're watching it on the thirtieth. Uh, I am going to stream it. I don't know if I'm going to stream the movie, but I'm at least going to stream the part where I get to interact with fans and ask questions and stuff. Yeah. But we're going to watch the 1989 Batman at a theater, and I'm going to point out to them, "Watch." He's going to say, "Does he get those wonderful toys?" And your brain automatically fills in where but it, on the blu-rays on the dvds on the digital downloads it doesn't matter he actually just says does he get those wonderful toys because the adr guy cut it off too soon i feel like that made the jack was just like why do i need the wear <laughs> does he get it's perfect the way it is i love or um in batman returns uh, uh tim burton was terrified of christopher walken and he tried to interact with him as little as possible <laughs> I think we're but, all terrified of this. <laughs> I love that guy, but yeah. Yeah. Talk He's the kind of guy you want to hang out with, but also you don't drink back of <laughs> So we have uh, those wonderful toys coming on ebook on February 2nd. Uh, Luke is set to record in the middle of February, so uh, with uh, ACX and Audible, I'm guessing a late March, March, March uh, release. March. So look forward to that one. Uh, I'm working on book eight right now, which is called Crack the Sky. Uh, a whole lot of fun on this one. Uh, so much title. fun. Very oh, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I love my titles. <laughs> um, and then uh, also make sure to check on the link. You have Unspoken uh, down there in the description. Uh, I'll put Max Abbott on, too. And, and of course, Leslie, um, yeah. Max Abbott yeah, just Max Leslie. Leslie. Yeah, the first one is Max Abbott on the will. second one is Max Abbott on purity law. We're in the third soon. We're just going to keep them cranking so they can never have nothing in your, your ear holes. I love it. I love it. So, uh, uh, thanks for spending the last hour with us, uh, guys. And, uh, Luke, uh, it's been, this is, you know, like I said, or we said, this is the first time we've actually met face to face as it were, just because, uh, I think we're so simpatico. Yes. There you go. Bump. There it is. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, you know, just get to chat today, but also to play in your world. And, uh, and I know that John is uh, very proud of you and, uh, very proud of himself, probably, and uh, I appreciate. Oh, well, oh, who is that beauty? <laughs> this is Bella. Bella, she's well, of course, right Bella. Now. She's beautiful. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. But, uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for spending the time with us. Uh, check out the links in the description. And as always, John on. <laughs>